Welcome to the second round of the Medfield TV Meet the Candidate Special for School Committee. In the first round, we introduced our candidates to the residents of Medfield, and in this round, we're having the candidates respond to both questions from the public as well as comments from each other. A brief rundown of how each show will go. This episode will run from the start to finish unedited. Candidates will get as much time as they need to answer questions and respond to comments. We'll open with the questions from our viewers. They were selected based on submissions from Facebook, and we selected the most liked comments as of the deadline of March 8th. It should be noted that Medfield TV broke any ties. We will then have candidates respond to comments made during the first round of interviews. From each candidate, you will see not only the clip, but the candidate's response unedited. Today, I'd like to welcome incumbent to the school committee, Leo Brem. Leo, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us, Brett. Yeah, this has been a uh, very active uh, race, and so we've, we've been seeing a lot of you, and we're very uh, excited to have you back in studio. Thank you for taking the time. It's really great to have this kind of service for Medfield. Absolutely. So, like I said, we're going to start with questions from our viewers. You know, you saw the Facebook post, you saw some of the questions out there, so we'll start with some of those. Sure. The first one comes from one of our top fans, Lauren. It says, if elected to the, uh, to the committee, how will you work towards making our schools more inclusive for all students? Sure. I mean, and I, and I took a few notes because there's so many ways that a school committee can support the administration in doing this. You know, first off, you know, um, is having, I'm, you know, I'm a big proponent of smaller class sizes, and that allows for teachers to have, you know, really strong, attentive opportunities, you know, with students um, to include them in more, um, more learning opportunities within the school within the school day and get to know them more personally and be able to personally uh, meet them where they are for their learning. You know, some of the other things that are important are special ed programs and our student support programs, right? Not everybody is, on spe is in special ed um, that requires extra learning uh, support, but there's other folks who need more learning support for whether it's particular interventions for reading or math. Um, or science of some kind, and we have to make sure that we have those specialists there to support those uh, those students. Um, more importantly, this year, um, or especially, is our guidance and uh, school psychologists this year. You know, because of the pandemic, we're absolutely going to need to have those people uh, available um, to make sure that the community is meeting all you know all of our learners uh, together. And uh, more traditionally, um, you know, a ways of being more inclusive to everybody is having program offerings that um, can meet all the different interests of students. You know, we're, we have a very um, great athletic program here in Medfield, as we all know. But if there's other, um, there are other opportunities that students want to take advantage of, like robotics, chess team, math, or uh, other interests. That, I mean, uh, e-gaming is another one that is really large and, and is tapping into um, a population of students that may otherwise not get involved in the, uh, in the school community as much. So, you know, these types of programs allow, um, you know, allow more of the school community to participate just outside of the school day, as well as during the school day. Um, things like the TV program, right, uh, and the communications programs that exist within the schools. All of those provide different opportunities for students of different interests um, to participate, you know, in the school community. You know, some of the other things are um, even more uh, finite are uh, programmatic pieces like um, more honors and AP level course offerings and more sections of those so that there's less competition to get into them and allow students to meet the challenge of taking those more advanced courses. And that requires, you know, strong instructional leadership um, and it requires the support of both financially from the town and, uh, and the school board to prioritize those things. Um, you know, within the budget. So most of those are things that are really important, um, you know, particularly in those upper levels. And then at our lower levels, it's, you know, opportunity to get into those classrooms. Aside from class size, it's our early childhood programs, uh, full day kindergarten, and making sure that our school buildings can support these type of pro these, these programs take space. So, you know, making sure that we're thinking strategically in the future, that our programming is only going to expand and we want our schools to be better. So we need to plan on having, you know, good space in our buildings to be able to run these programs. Otherwise, uh, we're just not going to have the space to do it. All right. And our next question comes from Jackie. She says, 
Do you think teacher unions influence school committee elections? And if so, what is the impact to schools? You know, I saw this question and, you know, I had to really think, you know, um, deeply about it. Uh, in my 26 years uh, in education, um, I have not seen any, you know, um, teacher unions actively participating in local elections. Um, I would occasionally see them support, um, uh, like state representatives, perhaps, um, and uh, maybe national elections. You might see something like a mailer or something from a t uh, you know large statewide unions. But from a local level, like I would no not expect like the Medfield Teachers Union or the Sharon Teachers Union or the Walpole Teachers Union uh, supporting any one particular candidate. At least I have not seen that in the past. Um, I guess there might be a question how that might impact the schools. Sure. Um, you know, maybe, you know, backing a candidate that supports teachers. But I think uh, anybody who's going to be on school committee and uh, be involved with their schools is going to support teachers as much as they're going to support students. So, um, so I guess that's how I'll leave that one. <laughs> All right. And our third question comes from Minta. This is the most popular question on our Facebook post. It says, please discuss how you would have been involved in Medfield Public Schools or Medfield Town Government prior to running for school committee as a parent, volunteer, on what committees, meetings, et cetera? Yeah, I would say um, for me, uh, right when I got to town, um, Medfield is a great community and they really try to reach out and get people involved. And one of the great um, organizations you have is something called New in Town. Um, and New in Town, um, you know, reached out to us right when we, right when we moved in. Uh, and it was a great way to kind of meet some people who were also new to town and talk to some folks um, just about what happens around town. Um, more specifically about being involved though, um, we were able, when we moved in, uh, the school department had already started, or the administration had started a strategic planning process. And so they had had a uh, series of meetings that my wife and I were able to participate in uh, to both get to know more about uh, what the school's goals were, what they felt they needed to have as their goals, and um, hear what other people in town thought were, uh, were important to the schools. And so we learned quite a bit from that process. Um, and then further on, uh, I've been a uh, soccer coach for uh, both of my children uh, for uh, at least five years, uh, maybe, maybe more. I've kind of lost track. I have uh, a collection of colorful t-shirts from uh, the younger years. Um, and now that uh, they're a little older, um, luckily the t-shirts might not be big enough anymore. So, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we've I've done a lot of that. Um, obviously, um, I volunteered at the school events when uh, before the pandemic, when we had uh, things like the fundraiser at Memorial uh, and so on. And um, and I always enjoyed reading to the classes. So uh, Read Across America Day, I've always participated in. Um, reading, uh, going in and volunteering to reading in the classrooms as well. Um, <clears throat> it's a very special for the kids and um, you get an opportunity to see their kids in the classroom environment and they ask the best questions too. I always like the question and answer time after I read a book. So, and then obviously um, over the last three years, um, the countless hundreds of hours that have been involved with uh, various subcommittees from being on school committee, um, you know, the uh, new elementary school project. Um, I've also served on the finance um, subcommittee and on the negotiations committee. Um, as a matter of fact, that was probably one of the first things I did uh, was around negotiations. Um, so getting to know what, <clears throat> you know, how our, our um, employees, are, what they're up against and what they're asking for, um, and a better understanding of what's happening right here in Medfield with those, with those groups of people. So very important. Um, and win or lose the election, I intend to continue to stay involved uh, in, uh, here in Medfield. Uh, again, I think it's good to have such um, interest in the schools. Um, it's exactly what I would expect uh, of a very um, engaging community who support the schools to be, is to have multiple people want to serve on that committee and, and be a part of it. Fantastic. We now move to the portion of this interview where we're gonna play you clips from the last section of interviews. The first one comes from yourself. You'll be able to uh, expand on this thought. It says, what was the most important part, uh, what was the most proud moment of your time as school committee? Yeah, I've been really pleased uh, with uh, two, 
two big things that I think are um, that were important to me uh, when running the last time. Uh, one was uh, around class sizes uh, and um, paying attention to those class sizes. I think that um, previously, uh, because Medfield is um, you know is considered a high performing school district, um, sometimes. Uh, attention to some of those details um, slips, and I think it's a it's an important part of what I call the core values of running a school district. In previous school districts that I've worked in, class size was um, a very important item. It was not uncommon to have uh, to hire new um, new teachers even one week before school started because the class sizes creeped up too um, too large, and we would. Um, we would post and hire an uh, additional teacher for that grade level to lower the number of the kids uh, in those classrooms. The other item I was very passionate about was our curriculum. Um, you know, prior, prior to the pandemic, um, it was very hard to find any of, any of the curriculum that uh, was being conducted in the classrooms uh, available to parents uh, so that or even a guide to understand just about what they're supposed to be tackling in, the, in any, any given school year. Now, I, being a lifelong educator, I have an idea of what the big ideas are um, across all subject areas at every grade level. Most parents do not, and it's something that the schools should provide is an organized uh, idea to parents so that they can help support that learning at home. Uh, in the two, my two previous school districts uh, I spent most of my career in, uh, also considered high performing districts, that curriculum uh, being available was extremely important because we're, we want to enable parents to be able to help support what's happening in school. Go right ahead. Yeah, I, you know, uh, I'm still proud of those, uh, I would say. Um, and I guess if I was to add uh, anything to it, I think it's getting through this last year. Um, and uh, perhaps I didn't give it enough uh, due and, uh, when we recorded that. Um, but you know, trying to maintain um, a focus on safety and support for our students during this past year um, and doing what was best for the entire community, uh, keeping our students, our staff, um, and the people at home safe with the information we were given uh, to make decisions at the time all throughout the, the process. You know, and I say that now because I believe I was probably pretty happy at that time um, we were planning our return and now we have solid dates uh, to return to. And, um, you know, I think last Thursday when um, Dr. Marston announced it, uh, I wasn't the only school committee member that was probably holding back a tear or two um, to announce that we were sending our, all of our kids back. And um, grades two to five will be back next Monday, um, which is awesome. And then middle and high school uh, shortly thereafter in the coming weeks. So, you know, um, you know, I think that was one thing that about working as a team, you know, um, working as a team this past year has been one of the most important items um, in order to be successful and stable. And there's been other communities that I've unfortunately seen that have not done as well. And it's had an adverse impact on their learning community as a whole. Um, and so I can't speak enough to the professionalism of my colleagues in the administration uh, and um, and the other town boards like Board of Health and Board of Selectmen and what they've done uh, as a unified team um, for the entire town and in particular the schools. So uh, I think that's probably um, one item that is important. You know, and I'll, and I'll reflect on that. You know, um, one of the other questions that didn't quite make it was someone commented on the. Um, the lack of, uh, or, or why were all the votes uh, unanimous, you know, in school board, you know, in our school committee in the past seven years. And I had to really reflect on that quite a bit. Um, and, I, and the only thing that could come to mind is, uh, is the amount of communication that Dr. Marsden puts into with us um, and that we do with each other on a personal level um, and the conversations that we have about <clears throat> what's best for learners, you know. Um, very few of our votes um, make earth-shattering shifts um, in in the day-to-day -day of our students, except for the larger ones like programmatic um, importance and prior prioritizing programs and what programs we move forward, um, and of course the budget, right? Which ones we prioritize within the budget? Those are probably the largest. Most of our votes are about um, about <laughs> ratifying minutes 
uh, and accepting donations uh, if you watch our uh, opening and closing of the meetings. So those are uh, the bulk of our votes. Um, but the ones that really mean something, as you know, like the, um, the financial ones that have a large financial impact on the taxpayer, we start talking and deliberating about that, um, you know, in the end of the calendar year, like in 20, you know, we started talking about that in November, December for this coming July 1. And, um, and that happens every year. I mean, this year is just because of the pandemic, we didn't start talking about it earlier. You know, school districts start planning their following budget in October of the school year. So for the next year, um, and that's standard practice so that uh, the school committees and the decision-making bodies can um, can hear what's important and um, take those things into consideration, uh, you know, as they're um, as they're seeing what the town can afford for the schools, um, what bubbles up during the school year, uh, and of course, what is the culture and what's important to the community. Things like class size or things like certain programming and you know, when you have to pit programs against each other, you have some pretty tough decisions to make. So I apologize, uh, we did just have a little system error, so we fixed that, but we're gonna pick right back up. This is the second question, it's from Lauren Lilligren on what two improvements she would make if elected to school committee. So th there's a few things there. Um, one is that at least this past year and, and perhaps in years prior, we've approved and ratified contracts that I don't believe were in the best interests of the children and families of Medfield. The existing school committee has seven years of unanimous votes. And I joke all the time, my family of five can't decide what shape of pasta to have. So I struggle with how five adults from different households who don't speak outside of school committee meetings um, have so few follow-up questions and always seem to have the same opinion. I don't see the discord that I would expect. I don't see the follow-up questions. I don't see the, the debate um, that I would expect to see uh, in a group of five people managing a, a budget of $40 million with, with all these competing interests. The second piece is we do have six open meeting law determinations in Medfield specific to the school committee. And you know, open meeting laws are complicated and, and some of these are, are small infractions, but to be clear, these aren't complaints. These are the actual determinations made by the AG's office. The Board of Health doesn't have any, um, the, uh, the selectmen don't have any, and none of our surrounding towns have, have any. So that seems noteworthy to me. Uh, it also comes at a cost of $40,000 to taxpayers, right? Because in all of these cases, the existing school committee has chosen to fight these complaints versus simply admit wrongdoing, right? It's you know, complicated, everybody makes mistakes and, and move on. So I think that's concerning to me that we're sort of not, I'd like to, to spend Medfield's money um, as, I would, as I'd spend my own. And I don't know that I would spend forty thousand dollars on a lawyer if, in the end, I knew I had made a you know a, an ultimately small infraction with with really very minor consequences, if any consequences. So, very interesting uh, um, points. So I'll respond to the first one is around um, negotiating contracts on that. So, you know, uh, Lauren has reached out to me about uh, what she feels is wrong in those contracts. And the feeling is, is that the teachers could just walk out at any time. You know, we said that we left a loophole in that because they could walk out at any time. And unfortunately, I'm, this is probably a misunderstanding of how schools actually operate, you know. Um, you know, that is actually not the case. There's, um, you know, the language in the, con in the MOU uh, for this pandemic year um, still relies back on the standard practice of um, disagreement uh, by the teachers union uh, that has to be communicated to the administration. And then there's deliberation uh, about what to do, to, whether or not the problem can be solved. And that is pretty standard language, um, you know, in those negotiations with uh, unions, particularly in teachers unions. So unfortunately, I think that's a misunderstanding, of, um, you know, on Lauren's part about what that contract actually said. You know, as to the open meeting law violations, um, you know, when uh, all six of those uh, particular uh, things came from one certain individual in town, um, and that certain individual seems to have a track record of um, wanting to um, test the boundaries of, of this, uh, you know, of the school committee, um, and probably hasn't dug deep in the Board of Health or on the Sletchman's minutes as much as this person um, 
keeps a, a hyper focus on ours. Um, and as far as the legal fees, you know, up before the open meeting law complaints came, uh, we carried a very small, much smaller budget, you know, for the legal fees. Um, it's a pretty complicated process to go through, which you know does require. If you saw any of the responses from uh, our particular attorney to those particular requests, she is right. They are all minor. They're a, they turn out to be minor items. Um, but when you're dealing with the AG's office and a bunch of lay people, when it comes to the law. Uh, the people who are elected to school board are um, not lawyers um, right now. Uh, we have had attorneys on before. Um, Chris Morrison was an, was an attorney, uh, and even he supported uh, the fact of having the right person look at these particular complaints. So um, I guess that's about the explanation of those. Uh, I'm not sure if the, the people of Medfield should be worried about their schools as a result of either one of those. Absolutely. The third question comes from Robert Worth on the social emotional effects on students after the pandemic. Once the pandemic is over, I do think that there will still be uh, lasting effects, um, you know, for the foreseeable future. Um, like I said, some of those, you know, inequities um, that existed uh, are now larger. Some of those achievement gaps are now larger. Um, we're really going to have to think about how, you know, the pandemic and the return to school has affected um, the social emotional health of our students beyond the pandemic, beyond that return to school and those effects, um, those negative effects of the pandemic that will kind of play its way into school for the next couple of years. Um, you know, I do think that those things are still very important. The social emotional health of our students, especially in a high achieving school district like Medfield, um, is always a top priority for me. Yeah, I couldn't agree with them more. You know, we have to absolutely, um, social emotional health has, has been paramount in, in the forefront for us um, prior to the pandemic. I mean, we have a social emotional um, growth director uh, on our staff. So, um, who has been actively working during this pandemic, uh, did a great presentation in one of our previous meetings um, on, on just what's been happening, because uh, we have our thumb on the pulse of what's happening within the, you know, with our students. And so I, I couldn't be uh, happier that that position is there and um, is helping to weigh in in our decision-making uh, and prioritization for this coming school year. Um, and obviously, we were already going to be hiring um, additional guides help prior to the pandemic. It was always already a priority for us. And of course, that's going to be something that needs to be uh, stapled in for the coming year and obviously moving forward. So I, I couldn't agree with them more. It's definitely something we need to um, not only maintain, but to uh, continue some hyper focus on as we transition out of the pandemic. Absolutely. The fourth question comes from yourself on how the school committee reacted to the pandemic. The work done by school committee and by the administration last summer to prepare our schools to be as safe as possible uh, was, um, un I don't think I saw any other school districts do as much as we did here uh, to prepare our schools and make them safe environments. Um, and I think that is evident in the number of uh, people who, um, who chose to send their students back versus going 100% uh, remote. That's an indicator of just how prepared we were to make our buildings safe, uh, make sure we had protocols in place for cleaning, mask wearing, and so on, consulting with the Board of Health, following the regulations, uh, and any type of new information released from the CDC or the state. Um, all these items working, all these items together fed into the decision making that we had to make um, and uh, the negotiating that had to be done with the teachers union. Yeah, I mean, uh, I s s mentioned that earlier. So we are we are scheduled to come back um, uh, with the teachers' blessings. Um, so um, they have said to us in our conversations just how appreciative they are for uh, the work that's gone into um, making the environment safe, um, maintaining the the rules and enforcement of the rules around mask wearing and distancing in the schools. Um, and so uh, you know, I maintain we did a. Um, you know, the best we possibly could and had a really strong outcome. Um, you know, with this return, um, actually on my way here, I was just listening to public radio on the way here, and it was concerns about um, upon people returning, having to quarantine again, um, because, or having to, subgroups within the district having to quarantine if someone is found positive. And, um, you know, we've seen no in-school spread here in Medfield, um, no evidence of that at this time. So. 
I'm confident that because of the protocols and all the work that the administration you know, did last summer, and I, honestly, I didn't do the physical work, we were just supporting, but um, you know, the constant communication um, and the um, flow of information that came from administration from last summer throughout till now uh, has prepared us as a community to go back with the confidence that we need. Um, and I think that's part of it. It's, it's being able to have families and teachers know that the administration and ultimately the school committee have their best interest at heart. And so, um, you know, we're all one, one community. And so we're not about to get school back in if it's not safe, if we don't feel it's safe or that the risk is um, so low that um, it's worth doing so. So I'm proudly sending my children back next Monday. I, I fully appreciate those families who have, um, have concerns and extenuating circumstances, and we will continue to support those folks. Um, and we, as you may have heard, we're also, if some students do have to quarantine, uh, the option to have that um, Zoom into the room, the window into the classroom is still gonna be available to those students who have to quarantine. So the importance of maintaining the school connection is, is paramount for us throughout this process. Uh, so, you know, I feel like we're prepared and, uh, and we have the full support of the town to do so. So we are excited about that. Fantastic. The next question comes from Lauren Lilligren on the return and recover from COVID-19. I think for me, it's, it's return and recover. We've always had an achievement gap in schools. It, it feels to me, and we don't have data on this, um, but I hope to get there, that the achievement gap is ever widening. And so I'd love to see a recovery plan that really calls out how are we going to manage this? Um, what about children coming in and who, who didn't need individualized education plans or 504s before, but maybe do now? And, you know, the summer slide is long documented. Uh, you know, we've had limited in-person instruction for a year now. Um, how can we use the summertime effectively to, to boost achievement? And one-on-one -on -one tutoring has long been understood to be a cost-effective way to immediately boost achievement. You know, let's look into that. So I'd like to see uh, and be involved in hopefully the execution of, but if not the, the development and execution of a recovery plan that, that really um, calls out to the community exactly what are we gonna do to, to get everybody back at least to where we were um, and hopefully, hopefully even better. So, I mean, well, as far as 504s and IEPs, uh, you know, an IEP would be a learning disability. Uh, they would have had with or without the pandemic. So uh, I, well, I guess I can respond by taking that off the table. Um, you know, we do have a 504 committee, you know, and like most school districts that if students need extra accommodations, um, I'm not sure if those accommodations would be impacted because of the uh, pandemic or created as a result of that, I'm not sure. Um, however, um, she's not wrong about being able to identify uh, any kind of uh, gaps that may have uh, occurred or, um, you know, falling off of what we call grade level, you know, or expected, you know, um, place in that process. Um, and as a matter of fact, I feel like we're going to probably have to uh, evaluate students from many perspectives. Um, some students may have excelled this year, um, and we're still going to have to, um, you know, keep that, that learner's interest, right? You know, maybe they excelled in math during this year because they got involved with some extra math um, programs. Um, how do we keep them uh, engaged in their learning uh, as well as the ones that maybe excelled in something else or maybe stayed on grade level. So, and that's called differentiation and, uh, and a lot of our teachers, our teachers do that already. Um, it's part of being a teacher, is being able to meet students where they are and then bring them along. And we know that we're gonna have to do a little bit more of that, particularly in social emotional areas. I'm not sure about an achievement gap per se, um, but of course, our you know our light MCAS scores this year will help us determine some of that, and of course, um, you know a few about two or three meetings ago, Dr. Marsden talked about some of the uh, benchmark assessment information that was coming back, um, and we've asked for uh, Dr. Powers to come in and give us a presentation uh, about some of those benchmark assessments. And for those who don't know what that is, it is an assessment, uh, a standardized assessment that's given multiple times throughout a year. Uh, so that you can measure growth uh, in certain skill areas. Um, but preliminary benchmark assessments have shown little or no slippage or growth uh, in the results so far. Now that's not across all grade levels and all subject areas, but that's off the standard ones like uh, reading, writing, and uh, math you know, that we 
I'll probably do a lot of that on. So I'm looking forward to seeing uh, that presentation. So I will say yes, the, um, the summer is going to be a good time to recharge. Um, personally, I feel like it's really going to be around social emotional health. How do we get our learners back into communicating and collaborating with their peers uh, more effectively so that they can learn together as a team? Uh, and that's the point of bringing our students together in our schools. Here's the last clip that we're going to play for you. It's from Robert Worth on the experience needed for school committee. Sure. In the past districts that I've been a part of, um, even though uh, you know not in an administrative role or not in a school committee member role, um, I've really been engaged in school committee and kind of keeping track on what's going on. Um, you know, school committees are generally pretty small um, in Massachusetts districts, uh, between five and seven members. And Medfield, you know, you have five members there. And I think what you're really looking for in a successful school committee is a diverse makeup of people from different backgrounds that really represent the community, represent the best interests of students and families. Um, in my current role, I'm able to do that very well and think about how schools run, the budgetary concerns, um, the day-to-day -day operations, curriculum, and the way that we implement it. Um, and by being in schools, working with students in classrooms, on the phone with families, engaging in the community every day in a different district, I'm really able to see kind of how that works and sometimes how it doesn't work. And I think I bring that knowledge to the role of a school committee member. You know, I don't think it's a necessary prerequisite to being a successful school committee member, but I surely think it helps. Uh, and I think that every school committee really deserves someone who has experience in education, in schools, um, and really can call themselves an educational expert. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Brett. Um, Rob's not, not wrong. I think that having a healthy understanding of what's happening in schools and having a lot of experience in school districts is, has been very helpful for me. Um, you know, I've spent 22 years, or 23 years in schools, public schools. Uh, I've worked in four different school districts, but most of them with the Sharon and Newton Public Schools here in Massachusetts. Um, and currently I'm uh, the interim director in um, Walpole Public Schools, um, helping them uh, as they transition while I'm still um, maintaining my position at, um, you know, an ed tech, ed tech uh, company that I co-founded some years ago. And um, it allows me to work with school districts from uh, across the country and both the Commonwealth. And I would say that the experience that Rob is talking about um, has been very much so uh, helped me uh, on my role with the school committee. Um, and as well as, um, at least I feel like, has helped um, you know explain things and how things work to the other school committee members who have not spent a lot of time in the inner workings of how a school works or the interaction uh, between, say, the teachers' union and the administration, for instance, um, or what it really means, how long something's going to take to implement because of just understanding what school culture is like. So those items are extremely important. Um, you know, out of that 22 years, um, 18, 19 of those have been as an administrator, um, you know, within those school districts. Uh, so working with uh, various school committees, um, and different levels of uh, administration throughout the school districts, like principals, system principals, and understanding the dynamic, um, I think has been extremely helpful for me to be realistic about what we're able to do in Medfield, um, as opposed to um, you know having a really lofty goal that we can't achieve, uh, but making sure that what we can achieve, what we do say we're going to achieve, is actually obtainable. So, and I think that's um, extremely important and. Um, and no, I don't think it's a um, requirement either. I, I'll, I'll echo that from Rob as well. I don't think it's a requirement um, because I feel like it's healthy to have other approaches um, on the board, you know, on the committee um, so that, you know, because you know, we're all representing people who don't understand the inner workings of a school. And I think that's one of the things I keep in the forefront of my mind is that not everybody understand how a school works and you know and particularly now through the pandemic we've seen our parents who don't work in schools having to become part-time teachers um, so you know I understand the stressors and um, I think that that is um, one of the reasons why we were so focused we, we've been so focused on how to support the learning at home and how we're going to um, 
you know, right the ship, if you will, or, or bounce back from this even stronger than before. Fantastic. Leo, is there anything else that you'd like to add, uh, given what you've talked about today? No, I think um, I've the campaign process has always um, uh, has always been humbling to me um, because you get to talk to so many people in the community, and um, I think probably this year more than ever is this really strong convictions and feelings. Right? Um, you know, for some people they feel you know it's life or death, uh, or it could be because of their particular situation. Um, and then it's recognizing the particularly hard time that people have been going through this year, you know, and um, my family's not immune to it either. You know, we've, we've felt it, we've seen it in our children. Um, and I just want to, you know, you know, relate to the community just how grateful I am to live in Medfield um, and grateful to have a community that is so invested in, um, in itself and doing the best for all the community members. And so for that, I'm very thankful and, uh, and grateful. And um, please get out there and vote on March 29th. Absolutely, Leo. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, like you said, this has been a, a long process, but March 29th is the final date. So thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having, thank you again for all you're doing, Brett. This is great. Absolutely. And thank you for watching at home. You're now educated. You know what's going on. You know who the candidates are. And if you've watched our What's on the Ballot, you also know everything else that's going to want on, on the ballot. So March 29th, Make sure you go out there and, uh, and vote. Thank you for watching.